I'm already introduced us. Well, come on. So why are you here and why are we here? So you are here, most of you, because you, your program partnered with the PDBG grant. And what that is, is um, essentially the background for that is there was a federal, huge federal funding that was given for early childhood. And Virginia is one of the 40 states that received funding, um, close to $2 million for us to assess what's happening in early childhood in Virginia, what we can do with this data that we've gathered, and how are we going to meet the needs of the children and of the teachers. So that's the basics of the grant. And thank you all for participating, and even if you are not, you are part of Virginia Quality or different uh, ways. So um, what we will be doing um, is coming in with this tool called class to basically observe and do an assessment and take that information for data to inform us on creating this plan. So um, it's really, so you'll have an observer coming in and I know we asked that question about how do you feel? And yeah, that's, that's her, just say Jen. <laughs> hey look, it's Jen. <laughs> you gotta sign in. Sign. Oh, Jen, there's a sign in right here. Everybody knows Jen now. <laughs> so we're going to um, introduce the tool to you. We don't expect you to be experts on it, but we want you to be familiar with it. So when somebody does come in to observe you, it's not anything that's surprising as far as what it is that they're going to be looking at. Um, so we are going to kind of get into the nitty gritty of what's in there. Um, and then the basics is positive interactions, and I know we talked about, we asked you that question, what is positive interactions? So I think um, I'll be reading the um, answers, talking, playing, listening, having fun, smiling, floor playing. So you all are already doing all of this, which is what class is looking at. It's not trying to teach you anything new, but it's all just looking at what it is that you're already doing. So like you all are already doing that. And we're going to, um, again, identify what are those positive things that you are doing in the classroom. So we are with Virginia Quality, and again, Virginia Quality is a state um, is a state funded program. And basically what we do is we go into the programs that sign on with us. It's a free, no cost program. And we give you anything that you need, whether it is professional development, if somebody wants to go back to school, there's money to get you back into school, whether you want to pursue your AA, your CDA, your master's, whatever it is, there's money for us to be able to help you get through that. Um, or very specific things, you know, like I'm having a hard time with managing this one child, what can we do? So we come, coach, and really work with you one-on-one -on -one and create a very individualized plan. So really on whichever level you're on, um, we try to provide that service. And we look at programs with levels. There's different steps to achieve level one through five. Um, and some of you are part of uh, Virginia Quality, and I know you through there. So um, we will be seeing you, whether you are part of the grant or Virginia Quality, we will be working with you closely. So, so one thing, so really, we're going to be talking about positive interim actions. We're going to be talking about a lot of what you already know because the class is our tool to assess it. So, so we want to give you an idea of what's in the class, but beneath all that is what you know about positive interactions, how you know. And one of the things to really think about in your actions is joy in your classroom. Is there joy in your classroom? And I suspect that there is because that's what draws us at this level to our classrooms, to our children. And um, this came from some work that um, Ray Pika did. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's a, a great advocate for early childhood education. And, and, she, they, and, and in Finland, they've done some studies. And what they found is the power of joy increases learning. And you know that. You know when your children are excited and engaged and happy that they're learning so well. So, so look at these things and just think, are you seeing these in your classroom? Are you seeing active and engaged children? Do you see children who want to be experts and master the material? 
Um, do you see children, can children work at their own levels, at their own paces? Do, you have, do they have a lot of choice in what they decide to do? Um, do you, they have time to finish a task? Can they get immersed in something and, and, and spend time doing it? And actually the next day, can they go back and, and work on it some more? Um, do they share and cooperate with each other? Is there a lot of opportunities to play? If you're seeing these things in your class, then what is going to be assessed in the interactions will be really high. This is a real good barometer. If you're seeing joy in your class, if you're seeing active and engaged children, then you're on the right track. You're doing all the right things. So, so a lot of what you hear, just think about what's happening in your class and how it matches up. So, so now, just think. What are some of the? What are some really positive things that have just happened in your class recently? What is something you know, just a lesson that you had that just went so well and the kids loved it, or something spontaneous that happened in your classroom and it, it just really surprised you about how wonderful it was, or a center that you created in there they always want to go to and it's very popular. So just take a minute to think about something positive in your classroom and just share it with someone right now at your, at your table. Followed their interest and, and you, you know, you just sort of follow their perspective and everything. So, all of 
that will show up in the class. Um, you know, like, like this is basically your background knowledge. Um, it's, it's your starting point. It's what you already know to engage your children and keep them happy and follow their interests. And um, so for this presentation, just take what you know and compare it to the ways we measure. Because when we explain how the class measures things, just take what you know and translate it to how, how we measure it. And what you're going to find is that when you look at these scales and stuff, it's really going to affirm what you know about good teaching. And, um, and the other thing is, one of the things that using the class will do in, in developing awareness of it is it's going to really sharpen and increase your observational skills. And it's going to increase the awareness of your own interactions. And this is actually really difficult because when you're interacting with children, when you're teaching children, you're in the moment. You know, you it's you can't really step back and look at yourself, you know, and say, oh, I'm doing this and this and this, because you are definitely in the moment. And, and sometimes all really what you can do is you can have a great experience and then you can go back and think about it and think about what it was that really made it great. And one of the ways that you can really increase your observational skills and your awareness is to actually partner with another teacher and take turns observing each other. And when you do that with a colleague, that's when you really become aware of how you interact. Because when you have watched someone else interact, you just start thinking of all the ways that you're doing it. So what so the probably the best one of the best things you can set up is some of your observations. You know, get familiar with the instrument and what it looks at, and then just do your own observing of each other. And you, the observer, a lot of times you learn even more than the person you're observing when you have to observe. So, so that's one of the things. Um, okay, so we want to show you um, the, the company that is um, put together a class. It's called Beachstone. They're out of UVA. And they have this extensive library of high quality of different aspects of teaching. So whether you are working on just foster climate, the relationship between the children and you, or whether you are working really on the curriculum piece of it, whatever it is, they have a very extensive video. So we want to show you. And this, this particular video is going to be on pre-K. There are three levels. There's an infant level, a toddler level, and pre-K. We'll look at all of them. But in this video, we're going to watch it twice. And it's what you're looking for is just a positive emotional connection with the child. And um, it's um, They are responding to a child who wants a center. So that's the kind of the lens that we are putting on to look at this particular interaction. And you're looking for the teacher's responsive and responsive and sensitivity to what the child needs.
I imagine that you saw a whole lot of things going on, like so many things going on, so many interactions, like she was interacting with a, one, a little girl, another group, and, and moved over to another thing. So there's so much going on, and it's really a lot to analyze, so we're going to look at it again. So, so, 
So when you've got a lot going on in your classroom, you can see how many interactions. It's like boom, 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 boom. I mean, you may as well be an air traffic controller with so much going on. So anyway. Um, <laughs> well, we showed the meters, but I didn't talk about it. But just for be sure. Um, so these are the three manuals. The, um, they're broken up into eight groups, and of course we're, we're through five, so this is all we're focusing on. But class actually goes all the way to full grade, and it's that same um, principle, so that carries all the way through. But for ours, infants are classified for class for zero to eighteen months. And the yellow one is the infant, um, and then the there's a little bit of an overlap, and you know the children are not that perfect timeline. So um, in respect to their development, there's the overlap of toddlers starting at 15 to 36 months. And how we approach it, um, the, to decide which class animal we will use for the classroom, if there is a mix of infant toddlers, is we use the majority. So if there's majority infants, we go with the infant um, And then for pre-K, it's the three design animals. So what is in the manual? Is it we're gonna, we're gonna, right? You're going to be very familiar with it very soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I just jump yes. in one yes. thing? Yes. My apologies. I've been trying to get the link out to folks. So let's try to bring Just to kind of ease anxiety a little bit, if the majority of your directors are going to become class observers, and they will be the ones doing the observations in the beginnings. So I know um, we've got someone from St. James coming. I know we've got someone from... Um, Kingdom's Kids time, um, and the Methodist Church. Um, Stacy's coming. Uh, I mean, pretty much every, actually every partner except for one is sending a trainer. So it's all good. We're here to help. And one of the things we will emphasize over and over again is you do not need to be an expert on the class tool. You do not need to know the manuals. It's the people that have been trained in it. We go through a two-day um, training for this, and then it's an annual recertification. So it's something that, no, no, you can, oh no, uh, something that we deal with. So in the classroom, we do not expect you to know the, the manual purpose. is a guide. Yep, this right. is more of a guide. And of course, uh, the point that we'll keep reemphasizing is you're already doing all of this. This is just a way of us being able to focus on what it is that you're yeah. doing and finding the intention behind it. Do we share why we're doing the observations? Yes. Okay. For the grant. Yeah. But for it's basically the state is looking for what is going on and it's going to be driving funding, it's going to be driving grant opportunities. So really what we're doing is we're helping the state in forming legislation that's going to come forward. So it's not nothing from your center is going to be reported out. You're not going to see Kingdom's kids got these scores. It's going to be as a whole, these are the strengths, these are the weaknesses, this is what we're going to do about it to every, bring everybody up. And as we mentioned, I mean, what we do is professional development. It will help us hone in on what it is that your program, your classroom, what the needs are, and to fill those needs. Um, so, is this battery slow? Is it? They may have just had a disconnect. What's it? So, so our goal is to kind of make you aware of what the class is. But deeper than that, it's everything you know about good teaching that is going to just have the class assessment be really strong. So you need, so what you really need to concentrate is on everything you know about good teaching and good interactions, and and be aware of how the class looks at it and measures it. But don't get distracted by that. Concentrate on, on what we know about good teaching. So, um, how do we assess? So, class is um, broken down into domains. And the one domain, um, for one age group, the domain is responsive care anything. Your job is to care for the children, period, meeting their needs. The second group is broken down into two domains emotional and behavioral support, engaged support for learning. So a little bit more, you know, distinct, you know, responsibilities for this age group. For the third age group, we have emotional support, classroom organization, and then instructional support. So what do you all think as far as age groups? We talked about how the class manuals the three age groups. Which one do you think the response of caregiving? Which age group do you think is important? Infants. Infants. Okay. The second one? Toddlers. Toddlers. 
secondary one. It's pretty angry. So then, who's an infant teacher? Okay, so we take this flashlight and turn it on. And, and you can see the infant teachers have it really easy because they only have one thing to do. And you're sort of like, as an infant teacher, you're like a flashlight, right? You're always on. And what you're trying to do is conserve that battery, make that battery last just as long as possible. So I'll tell you when you can turn that battery off. When all your children are sleeping and you don't have to hold or pat or anything, a single one of them. When everything is cleaned up in your classroom and ready, you don't have to pick up a single thing. When you don't have to call a parent or write to a parent or find the material, you can turn it off. So, okay, how, so can you turn it off? Yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, I'm 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 so, I mean, obviously it's broken down based on the child's development on meeting their needs. So, um, the domains is your overarching, you know, concept. We're going to get into, you yeah, the nitty gritty of it. There's a lot underneath responsive care to me. Um, so, the way, this is all kind of just for your knowledge, but you don't need to hold on to any of this. Um, the way it's scored, it's really low range, mid range, and high range. And, um, yeah, so, don't worry about it, just the FYI, this is the scoring. Okay, so let's look at an infant class video. While she's pulling that up, I'll just share with you, as far as the state is concerned and what we're reporting out, it's basically a spreadsheet, and for each one of the different domains, it'll say low, medium, and high, or whatever it is, it doesn't give you a number, so it's not going to be like you're a two, you're a four, you're a six, it's low, medium, and high. Do you need a hot
going on there. So we'll watch it one more time just to Smiling, smiling, smiling. 
one is important. So keep back things they say, ask them questions, be getting down the level. They're very interested in the level of communication on all calls and all. Fabulous, thank you. So now you're an expert. Good to think. Different bullets. So you check them off. Are you done? No. No, no, you're not. So that's the whole point of this is that it's not a checklist. Right. It's not something that you can just go through and say, yep, I do it, do it, do it, and I'm done. You know, we have your environmental scale that we do for that. You know, you have all these materials, yes I do. But with interactions, it's not that easy just to check off and keep going. So there's no teaching the class. It is how you are, how you relate, how you work with the environment that you are in, you know, whether you are in a classroom that's full of resources or you're not. It's, so it's your relationship is the basics of class. Um, this is yeah, this is another one that we'll skip through. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and get your phones out for that interactive polling that we were going to do. Oh, okay. Right. That will make you a better teacher. 
and if they observe you, but but being a class observer doesn't make you a better teacher. Well, getting positive feedback. That's what I'm saying. But it, getting positive feedback in the context of observing a colleague was right. really helpful because you can have that discussion beforehand. You can say, I want to work on um, just really supporting some higher level thinking. I want to ask some open-ended questions and have some more follow-up. And and so if you talk to your your colleague like that, and and then he or she comes in and observes you and says, oh, this is what I saw, and then that not only will help you, but it will also help the person who's observing. That's that's the way for you to use the class to be a better teacher. Makes sense. Yeah, not get lost in all the details or anything, but to do that. Knowing the class tool will make you an expert on positive interactions. False. False. Yeah. Yes. It's false. It might make you more aware of positive interactions, but you know, there's a lot of ways to, to get information on positive interactions. A classroom coded in the high range in pre-K class showed that children in that classroom know their alphabet <laughs> and their numbers. False. 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 We love yeah. it. It's, I mean, it's, it's laughable, but unfortunately, this is where we don't want to do the whole teaching to the test. It's not a curriculum. It's not something you can check off. There's a lot more to it. Um, Terry, Amada, or any other class specialist know what you need to do in your classroom in order to be coded high in class. No, thank yeah. Well, you should know. Yeah. Well, we know what the class measures, and we know what to observe for the class, and we know what behaviors to look for. But you know your class, and you know your students, and you know your curriculum, and you are really the experts there. And we can come in and we can say, these are the dimensions that the class is looking at, but, you but you're observing. You're, you're the, the expert in your So you, you are doing the observing. You're the one giving us the points, so to speak. Um, so how is that supposed to help us? So, for example, if you have a child who responds to something in a particular way, mm -hmm. and then you know that child because obviously we don't, you know that child, and you respond accordingly, you meet that child's needs. There is, there's no textbook that's, that's answer to that. That's what we're talking okay. about. Okay. It's you being able to meet the needs in your classroom for your children. We can, we know the tool. Yeah. But you know your classroom. You know what works in your classroom. To keep that that joy, that positive, you know, energy in your classroom. That's that's the teachers. <laughs> now I'm, I'm speaking at I just want to step back a little. I'm speaking at this as a class specialist, not as a coach or a mentor. If we are in your classroom coaching, then we're gonna be working with you on figuring out. Okay. What is going to be the best? Yeah, we'll be so there's that difference, you know, in which hat we're wearing. Would that, would that be after you've done the specialist? We are hoping once we um, get the data that we'll be able to provide. But it's different more. people. Like the people that do the actual rating and coding generally are not the people that need to coach. So it'll be your director, your curriculum person, you know, whoever it is will be able to. Okay, so the class dimensions assess the interactions between teacher and children, the presence of materials, the physical environment, and the specific curriculum. I'll give you a chance to read it over one more time if you need. We're not measuring all that other stuff because if you have all that other stuff in place, most likely your interactions are going to be kind of flowing. It only focuses on the interactions. As a teacher, you want to support children by providing them with constant praise. Good job. Awesome. You're so smart. It's your brain. Yeah. <laughs> it's been around for a while. Yeah, it's been around all of that. 
So what do we think? Let's 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 you're supposed to get my positive Okay. But let's be specific. See, that's, yeah, that's the key word. Yeah. 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 Gosh, you get to go so <laughs> Kiss your brain. Talk about the answer. You're yes. noting the answer. You must kiss your brain. Right? <laughs> everybody, I mean, everybody wants to hear that. I think we have probably said that's like, yes, exactly. That is what we're looking for. But let's give them more specific feedback on why it was a good job. What was so awesome about it? The class is a great one for teaching interactions. It's not a curriculum. Yeah. Not a curriculum. It helps us, I think the key word is aware, be more aware. Uh, and that is it. <laughs> so, um, again, just kind of going to, just to show you, so you're aware of what's in here. Um, it's broken down, it's, it's called a face page, and I think it's similar to what you all read. You know, it's uh, just kind of break down, and what it shows, the low range, is that you don't see it, or you rarely see it. The mid range, you see it sometimes, and the high range, you see it the majority of the time that you're there, so that you can tell it's a constant practice. This may be a silly question. What are you expecting? Middle or high? Um, so the night. <laughs> yeah, it's really your goals on what it is that you're looking for. I mean, of course, you know, the if you have all the resources, what are you, if you're able to provide it. I mean, is this like on a bell curve? Sure. Yes, yes. So the night well, all, it's sort of on a bell curve, but it's not really. really not really. I mean, I mean what Probably what you will find when you start is there are going to be some dimensions that you're going to score high in, and you're probably already there. And then there's going to be some dimensions that you're going to want to work on. And overall, like as we get further into this, we can, start, we can kind of predict the dimensions that are going to be your strongest ones. And, um, and then just based on the conversation that we've had already, I, I would suspect that you're you are going to be very strong in the emotional climate and relationship um, dimension. You know, that is, that will probably still find you know, just right off the bat. Maybe share where you see some of those. Yeah, but we, oh, that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, go through the domains, um, the, yeah. each of the dimensions. We'll kind of go through what we okay. see normally. Okay, so what is class? This is kind of getting into it. Um, I always do that. Okay, so uh, the way I like to think of class is a building. So what do we first need to construct? The foundation. The foundation. Whoops. Okay. So uh, again, the PST and I stand for the H group. So the foundation. This is where we see the emotional support. So you're meeting the the needs. You know, the emotional needs of the children. So you have your foundation down. What do you need after that? The walls. The walls. All right. So in preschool, um, in pre-K, we look at that as the classroom organization. And for toddler, it's the engaged support for learning. So the domain has changed for toddler. And for infant, responsive caregiving. Okay, so we have our walls. What do we need? The roof. Whether it's going to be a flat roof, whatever type of roof, we need the roof. So in pre-K, this is the instructional support. This is where you see your curriculum, where your language, you know, where you are um, developing their concepts, etc. Toddler, engage support for learning. You're seeing that again. And infants, response to caregiving. Okay, so now we have an activity to... Um, so you want to take a little stretch, stretching, yeah. Yeah. stretching, and yeah. have some pizza, and have some pizza, and I'll talk you through this activity. Basically, um, we're going to be making a box and writing some things on it and decorating it. So why don't we just go ahead and get some pizza in a box. Yeah, we'll tell you. Uh, 
worked. And they're yeah. safe in the, the little supply boxes that Chris has yeah. provided. Yeah, we're really in that life. So you can make a bunch of things you want to plan it out to write on it. You want to start writing down the end of the pizza? Oh, so we're going to. What you have to do is find the top of the box. So it has a little handy card. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then on the top of the box, you got a what? Right. Um, be present on the top of the box. Well, you got to be faster than that. Be present. This box is going to illustrate you. How do you can get yourself ready for positive interactions? So you, in your classroom, you always want to be present. You always want to be in the moment. You always want to be there. Yes. And so that goes on the top. And then one one side, right, me check. What is the other side of me? The top, right? Sorry, that was a second. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you got that wrong. Me, 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 me. Here it comes. <laughs> Me check. Me check. What's the, what's the and doing a me check, when you enter the classroom, you know, you always have a lot of things on your mind. You can call it static, you can call it just what you're worried about, what you're thinking about, because you always come into the classroom having done a whole bunch of stuff at home, and you've got a whole other life outside of the classroom. So you have a lot of static. So when you enter the classroom, it basically needs to just sort of clear it all out. And just be very present in the classroom. So a meat check is just a way to sort of quiet your mind. And some people take a breath, some people sing, I don't know. There's all different ways to quiet and static. And we actually ask the same things of our children. You know, some of our children can come from really challenging environments. And we ask them when they enter that classroom to kind of put that all aside. You're in a safe environment, you're in a supportive environment. In a you know, it's just time to be in there. So that's what a meat check is. And then the other thing is connect. You want to connect with your children. And that's when, you know, it's very important to slow down and stay in the moment. So when you're showing respect, when you're personalizing your interactions, when you keep trust growing, because trust is so key, um, and you're listening to the children, and you're learning about them, and you're guiding their behavior, and all of that is really important to connect. So that's another part you want to write on there. And then you want to write um, temperament. You have to write all this stuff. The temperament, or interest, or preference. Because you have to be aware, of, first, of your own temperament. Like, some of us are very active. We like to move from one thing to another to another. And some of us prefer to think about something before we go to the next thing. And our children have temperaments, too. Um, some of us are very distractible. I mean, we really like to, you know, go in a lot of different directions. And some people are just very focused, and they only want to do one thing at one time. And you don't push them. Um, there's differences in intensity. There's some people are very approachable, and some people just like a little bit of space. So there's all kinds of different temperaments. So you have to know your own temperament, and then you have to know your children's temperament. And the other dimension that makes it very difficult is children's temperaments are still evolving. And so you have to be aware of that too. Your children are going to grow and change, but the temperament. And then also you want to follow their interests and, and, and follow their preferences. And sometimes your interests and preferences <coughs> match. Like some people like like me, I like things really messy and kind of chaotic. And, you know, I'm very comfortable with that. And 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 but but I had to children before that you know they like you know, kind of like to know where things are and what's going to happen next, and I have to be sensitive to that. So every, there's all there's just a lot of differences. And I'm like that, so her and I, very interesting dynamic when we work together. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other one is extend. 
And this talks about extending the learning and extending the thinking. And you want to help children see themselves as thinkers. You want to, you want to respond to their curiosity. You want to inspire imaginative play. You want to do everything you can to support that higher level. Because that's what our really true dream is, is teaching our children how to think. Because they're going to have to hopefully smarter than us and make better decisions, you know, and, and that's what we want to set them up for. So we want to ask questions, we want to laugh with the children, we want to link the new to the familiar and challenge them, we want to solve problems together, and this starts with infancy. I mean, in that video we saw that child was so responsive, and that teacher was so responsive, and they were both giving cues to each other. So, and now we've all extended that job. So there's your box, and now you can decorate the stickers and the bow and whatever. And you can see some side where we put this whole set of stuff cover. Do you all want to take a quick stretch, or are you yeah, okay? That if you do it. We've been holding all day. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. What a surprise. <laughs> you are a person. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm holding like all the decorations. Do we need to have them? All right, so what you're making is this is so this is pretty much a summary of, of what we've talked about so far. Like these are our delivery systems. It's play-based, active learning. It's centers and it's group. Small, large, and individual groupings of children. That's how we deliver what we're, what we're doing. And now, we have three keywords. You remember these keywords. If you act on these, you are just going to your, your class assessment will be one more. It's engaged. The children are engaged in what they're doing. And, and, and then the next one is join in. You join in with them. You know, you involve yourself with them. And the last one is responsive. You're very aware of what they're telling you. You're listening to them. You're responding. You're, you're there. You're in the moment. And, and that's what you need. And there is a magic word. Please. Oh. And the magic <laughs> word is engagement. Oh, Usually yeah. we make a race, so we don't need to do that in But engagement, that's your best barometer. If people are, if the children are engaged in your classroom, you're on the right track. They're working on their highest levels, they're working on their highest social levels, their highest thinking levels, their highest fine motor. You see all those skills when they're engaged. And and as long as you, and, and if you've got your children engaged, you're tapping into everything. And, and and that's and a lot of times, you know, when you have your centers and your children are really involved in your centers, they're extremely engaged. And what you do is you facilitate, you know, that engagement. I mean, you facilitate it beforehand because you've set up the centers and you've brought in materials that you know and you, you know you know will excite them and you've talked about things when you've been together and and then and then. Once the centers are open and they're working them, you're there for them. So, anyway, engagement is magic. Um, so now we'll get into the nitty gritty of the pool. Um, so this is the infants, and we're going to go through all three age groups just because we have all three here. Um, so the infants, we saw that there is just one um, domain, which is responsive caregiving. And within that, I can mention, you know, it does get into details within that. So within that, you have relational climate, teacher sensitivity. Yeah, we're going to cast out some score sheets. You can write on these. It'll just make it easier to talk. We just have to collect them after. Yeah, so they are. Sorry, don't write on them. Oh, you can't. No, you can write on them. We just have to collect them. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're just doing it to see our, yeah. our order didn't come in in time. So oh, just, your order didn't come. Yeah. But, yeah, but we'll get them to you. 
Um, this is actually just, just the pre-K. Pre this is just the pre-K, but... Oh, we don't have No, I'm sorry, that was just the pre-K. So, yeah. I apologize. It's um, feature sensitivity, facilitated exploration, and early language support. So within that, we have... So we'll start first with the relational climate. So, um, just there's, you know, different words to describe what it is that we're looking at. So the domain's the overarching, dimensions is the next step. Within the dimensions, you have indicators and the behavioral markers. So if you, um, the behavioral markers is what, um, is the action item, if you will. So um, relational behaviors. So we see this by how close you are with the infant. You know, going back to that infant video we saw, she was holding this child. So very close. Eye contact. Um, joint attention and affection. We saw all of that. We'll just keep referring back to that one infant video. Um, emotional, emotion expression, smiling, laughing, and enthusiasm. You know, it's really listen for the intonations. Um, is it just flat voice or is there, you know, that up and down quietness and excitement? And you hear all of that. So as a um, observer, that is kind of what I wanted to say I'm going to be listening for and looking for. And respect for infant state. Um, this is one of the ones that actually I find that many infant teachers have the hardest time with. When we wipe noses, what do we do? Just kind of think about, it, you know. And one of the things, you know, we'll go back to what we said earlier. It's not necessarily a curriculum. It is not. I mean, it's not a curriculum. It's not a you know way to tell you what, how to be the best teacher. But it's a way to create awareness of yes. your practice. So that's the key that. So as you're going through this, think about yourself, think about you know, how you function in the classroom. So diaper change, okay, I'm gonna pick you up and move you. No, what we want to hear is, it's time to change your diaper, I'm gonna pick you up right now, and we're gonna go over to the diaper change, da 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 So within that one, you have accomplished many things. You respect the child's space and their body, you've given them vocabulary, and then also prediction, you know, all these great skills that they need by doing something that simple versus just pick up and put down. Um, lack of adult thing activity, I don't think we have to really go there. Um, oh, well, actually, you know what, one thing I do want to mention with this, um, it's a subtle thing, but one of the things that I have heard is when there is a poopy diaper, the response the teacher gives about that diaper. You know, you can say something, oh, it's a stinky one, or, oh, goodness, I have to change another stinky diaper. You know, that that will, you know, fall under this one right here. And unfortunately, we do see that, or dirty faces, you know, etc. Okay, the second one is teacher sensitivity. And what we're looking for is awareness and cue deductions. Your infants are not going to be verbal, most likely, they are communicating with you in many other ways. Are you picking those up? You know, are you picking up this child really wants to get that ball that's under the table and can't reach it, and is making all these grunty sounds, or you're over here? How are you paying attention to that child? How are you responding to that child's name? You know, you're feeding way over there. I can't come to you right now, but I see that you're looking for that ball, and I will come and help you as soon as I am done. Or so and so, can you go help? So just really, even if you physically can't be there, acknowledge it. Um, speaks for itself. Infant <laughs> comfort. What you were talking about earlier, all these children that, coming, you know, that are coming to you, it's because you're doing your job as their teacher. They want to come to you. And um, the other thing, you know, when the parent leaves, when the caregiver leaves, what do they do? And you know, are they comforted by you? Are they screaming even louder? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> okay, so the third one is facilitated exploration. Um, you know, we, of course, we have our lesson plan, we could add activities for them. What are you doing? You put it out, you let the child play. What are you doing after that? How are you helping guide them? That's what we're looking for here. Um, they may not necessarily play with you, but it's the fact that you're sitting right there playing with them, or you're communicating it with your words from where, you know, your diaper changing duties, whatever else that you're doing. And, and that kind 
the book um, speaks for itself, really allowing their choice. And um, setting up, this is where, you know, the, your environment, you've done that legwork already. The environment is set up for this infant to succeed with maybe playing with each other, with really interacting with their environment and adjusting that, you know, so um, you have, you know, child is becoming mobile. How are you making that experience possible so they are not going to hurt themselves or you're constantly saying, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this, you don't want that. You know, this is where you go back to the amount and adjusting that accordingly. And then the fourth one is early language support. Uh, you know, constant, constant thing I think we hear is, they don't talk to me, I have no idea what to say to them. Talk about yourself. You know, oh, after you know, school today, I'm going to be going to the grocery store. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing that. Whatever it is that's going on in your head. The static that we yes. talked about when we were doing the big present. Say it out loud. You know? I mean, as long as it's something positive, of course. <laughs> say it out loud, you know? <laughs> or, so really just speaking. You know, they constant, just, they want to hear that language. And it's a great way to, um, and not do the, you know, baby talk necessarily. We want to, you know, just talk just like we normally do. Um, <coughs> and communication support. You repeat ba. What do you want to say? Ba, 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 ba. So, you know, just following their leads. And model take turn taking, and um, there's actually a great video for that. If we get to it, we can um, show you that. Um, but giving them that chance to respond, so not just rushing, but giving them that chance to respond and showing them and waiting for them. So that's the infants in a nutshell. And we'll do videos in the end, just for the sake of time. Toddlers, emotional behavioral support, and facilitation of learning and development. So now we have the two domains. It's, you know, they're becoming more verbal, more complex in their interactions with you, etc. So you want to be able to support that. Um, so in the emotional behavioral support, we have five <laughs> dimensions. First one is positive climate. Um, I think most of them really kind of speak for themselves. We're starting to see more peer interactions here. So you know, how are you supporting that? So, you know, if somebody's having a conflict, you are using words to help both of them or getting down and, you know, ask them to come over and talk to each other. Uh, smiling, etc. Respect. Um, and this one also, the body orientation is one of the ones I want to point out, is that you don't, you know, you're, you're facing the person that you are speaking to. You're getting down on the floor with them, and you know, it's really, again, that respect. this negative climate and unfortunately we start seeing more of it in the toddler classroom from the teachers. Um, so sarcasm I would say probably is one of the ones that I experience more in the toddler class. I see more of it in the toddler classroom. And as here, you know, what we're looking at is with, um, with the environment you've created, you're going to start seeing it in the children. You know, so it's not just you, but it's the children. So it starts measuring that in the power. So how are they handling each other? And if you've set up that environment for them to be successful, you're not going to see much of that. And sure, they're going to have conflict, but what we're looking for and what we are concerned about is does it escalate? Or if it happens once, you deal with it, or the children know how to deal with it, and they move on. Then teacher sensitivity, awareness, you know, kind of same thing with the infants that we talked about, is are you paying attention to everybody in the classroom and you see that somebody's starting to get upset, how do you respond to them before it actually happens? Um, providing comfort and accepting their emotions, I think that's the case, you know, um, or my pet peeve, you're okay. 
why would that not be probably the best thing to say to a child? Because you're, you're upset for a reason. Yeah, you're yeah. really not okay. Yeah. So you give them the words, I see that you are upset because, whatever it is. Or I see that you are hurting because you have a cut. So you're not just saying you're okay, you're just dis not dismissing. Um, going back to child comfort, you know, are they really approaching you? And the other um, key here is a genuine problem resolution. Um, and we saw that in the pre-K video, but you see it in the conference as well. Did you solve that problem enough for that child to be happy with the way it happened? Or do we still need to do more? for child perspectives. Choices, again, choices, 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 letting them have the choice. You have your activity that you plan, but being flexible enough that you can go with the flow and change if needed. Um, that's the next one. Um, materials accessible. So I'll point this out. We know how earlier in the pool we talked about the environment. So. We're not measuring the environment in class, but it is measuring the environment in a different way. So if a child has to keep constantly saying, can you get that for me? I want to do that now. And all the beautiful fun stuff are up high because some teachers don't want the children to access them and make a mess or so the child constantly has to ask for it. That's not a successful environment for the children or for yourself. the behavior guidance. So are you proactively, um, sorry, are you proactively uh, paying attention? You know, are you setting it up? Again, this goes back to, you know, maybe your lesson planning. This goes back to all those things that you have to do up front to make sure your day runs smoothly. One thing I would want to point out here is positive phrasing of the desired behavior. And I think one of you mentioned it when we watched the video that you did, that it was the negative was not pointed out. It was always the positive, positive, positive. You know, one of the things that I tell a lot of the teachers I work with is that I don't want to hear the word N-O. You know, whether you're saying don't or can't or no, it's what can we do? What are my choices here? Yes, I understand that this may not be the best choice, so what are my choices? So really giving them the ways for them to be successful. Um, problem behavior. So minimal wandering, waiting. So transitions, I know that's the hardest, hardest thing to do. But what are you doing in that time? You know, are you singing a song? Are you playing you know, games with them? Can they go read in the book area until everybody's ready rather than waiting in line or waiting in circle time, whatever it is. So different ways that you are combating. And because that's eventually going to lead to problems. Okay, so, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so this is the second dimension, which is facilitation of learning and development. And this is your curriculum, if you will. Oh. <laughs> um, so you just it's just facilitation, it's just active facilitation. It's it's providing guidance and just activities that will support how they learn and, and keep them engaged and extend their thinking. And expansion of cognition, if this is where you're tapping into higher level thinking and concepts. And what's really helpful is if you identify the concept that you're going to work on, if you teach with that intentionality, that really helps you focus. That doesn't mean that your activity is only going to hit that one concept. You will find when you have a good activity, you're going to be hitting more than one concept. But a lot of times, if you yourself have focused on that one concept, you can actually, it just actually helps you guide it to a higher level. But it doesn't, doesn't mean you're 
you're not going to hit other concepts. In fact, you'll probably be surprised by how many other concepts you have to do with So this is your curriculum, if you will. Now it is active engagement. You know, if you're actively engaged, you're going to see that you're going to see the manipulating materials. You're going to see the physical involvement. You're going to see that they're verbally involved too. So your barometer again is engaged. So as we mentioned, curriculum, you know, this is this is it. So there's no, you know, one set curriculum that class is saying is better than another or that you even have to have any particular curriculum. It can be your own because you know your children, you know what's going to work for you with experience, etc. It's modified. But it's, are you meeting the needs of the children, you know, with their thinking skills, with um, giving them materials, you know, to work with, you know, and to use their language. Um, and again, it's not looking at children who can just speak, you know, it's other ways that they can communicate. So if you have a child who cannot, you know, verbally verbalize things, how else are you encouraging them to communicate? So this is, you know, for all developmental needs, um, all physical needs, all, you know, cognitive needs. It, it's what, you, what we talked about earlier, you know, we don't know your children, you do. So it's meeting their particular needs. It's a quality of feedback. Um, so we talked about things that are tougher than others. This is one that's tougher. And um, so, in a range, you know, if you will, this is where you would see more mid range than you see high range in classrooms on an average. So, this is where you're giving them hints, you know, it's um, the scaffolding. So, you know, it's, you have to be really on it and just keep going and going, you know, and until that child is satisfied or got the answer that they're, they're really looking for, or maybe you're not there yet and you have to still continue, you know. <coughs> Uh, but it's the fact that you are helping them really think through it. And uh, if they are doing something physical, you know, how, you know, hey, I see that you're struggling climbing that. What can, how are you helping that child climb? You know, it's making those modifications. Um, again, this is, you know, really going into that thinking. This is the meat of it, if you will. You know, the other stuff, you've got your environment, you've got your, you know, relationship, you've got all this stuff. Now you're working on expanding their brains in the actual, you know, the, the learning, you know, piece of it. And we talked about encouragement and affirmation. You know, it's not just saying good job and awesome. It's very specific to what it is that they've done. Um, again, this is one of the tougher ones. Um, supporting language use. Just the back and forth. I mean, toddlers, why, 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 why? You know, <laughs> you're going to have to answer that why. You know, or let's find out together. So really, you know, working with them on what it is that they're asking and including their name. And open-ended questioning. And we are going to give you a resource. Um, we have a collection of open-ended questions that can be used from infant all the way to adulthood. Um, and then um, contingent responding. So you have something in your mind on your particular activity. Child wants to take it somewhere else. Making sure you're following that lead and responding to them accordingly. Um, extensions, you know, the big thing. Okay, so this is red. This is a square. Tell me what makes you think that this is a square. So getting them to really expand on that concept. Um, self and parallel talk, we definitely want to keep hearing that, not just in the infant age group, but toddler as well. Advanced language, so not just the words that they already know, but we want to keep pushing them up higher. The elements in the infant and the toddler are really the same. It's just sort of really defined for in the pre k But if the best way to think about it, just think of the three areas. It's emotional support, classroom organization, and structural support. Now, when you ask, like, where would the strongest score be in the emotional support areas, those are where you will see your highest um, ranges. And because Everybody in this room is here for a reason because you really 
like your children. I'm sure you have frustrating days and days where you think, oh my gosh, why am I doing this? But then the next day everything is wonderful as so you're like, I love this job. But, <laughs> but you're here because you're connected to your children. And you're going to, you're going to, that is where you're going to respond to it. Well, that's where you get the high school. The next room, classroom organization, that's when you learn kind of on the job. You know, you learn how to um, keep things moving, keep the children safe, give them choices, have a really nice schedule, um, tell them how not to do something by not really, you just, you just know how to do it. You know, you, you just know how to be very proactive instead of an environment that's going to allow, it's just going to allow them to, to behave well and be really engaged and, and be cooperative and get along with each other. That's the, that, that takes several years to develop, but that's the one you develop. And the last one, instructional support. This is what we as teachers, we work on this forever. This is, this is kind of the art and the science of teaching. You know, this is, this is really getting everybody to work on higher level thinking skills. And this never stops. You're always fine tuning this well. And this is where you can get so much support from each other. Um, and this will be probably where most of the staff development in terms of the class will be in the instructional domain. And it will be, I mean, instructional support. And it will be in. Um, the toddler that using language and using, um, ex, you know, experiences to really support that thinking. So that's what most of the work will be. And in the infants, it's all wrapped up together. I mean, you just have to, you just have to be on. But anyway, so you think of it in these three areas. There's a connection, and that's the basic. That's the most important. That's where you're starting. It's that connection that you have with your children. And then the second one is how you set up your classroom and how you make it run smoothly and how you set it up so that children can be very productive. And you've got a good learning, you know, good presentation of the concepts you want. And then the, the third is how do you get them to that high level. And now here they all are. The emotional support domain is a positive climate. Um, and you're looking at relationships and things, because I think this is, and you're looking at being positive and, you know, when you're laughing, the children are laughing at the same time, respect, eye contact, all of that. And when you get here, you know, you'll get this, you'll get a scoring sheet, you will have all this written down. And then the next one is negative climate. And we really do not see much of this, and we almost rarely see punitive control. It's very rare that we see that. But sarcasm, like Amina said, is something to watch out for. We can, we can think you're being clever and be sarcastic. Um, we rarely see severe negativity. Um, sometimes we see irritability, but it usually doesn't really get very far. And sometimes at the end of the day, yeah. Um, the fear of aggression, I'll just point out, is in here as well. Again, that if everything else is working, you're not going to see much of the fear of aggression. But yeah, and that, that, is a, that is a really good barometer. And also note that on any day, you can have any child act out or be unhappy or be upset. And that isn't necessarily a reflection on how you set up things. Like, we expect children to be upset and to, you know, it is, it's, it's more how you handle it. It isn't, it isn't that, so if you have, so if you're being observed and somebody really has a meltdown and stuff, that's okay. It's, it's how you handle it. And children can be upset for things that happen, you know, they have nothing to do with your life and be terribly upset. And, and it's really how you deal with it. So, so don't, that's not going to reflect negatively on you. Um, oh, they get a little fear of lagging. They have to do that for once. Like, yeah, that would be like a fear that the children are afraid of being. Yeah, and you, you know, when you would see it in, in their expression, you would, it would show up in following um, their lead and everything. You would be seeing that. And, and teachers.
your sensitivity, that's your awareness, that's how people need to respond, that's if you address problems. And it's also, you can have an observation and see absolutely no problems, you know, because sometimes things go really well and you've got things really set up really well. And student comfort, that's a real good indicator. If the children feel comfortable with approaching you, then you're, then you're And there are classes like that. Everything is following the teacher's lead. And actually, a long time ago, that used to be really important. You know, you wanted you wanted the teacher to be the director, and you wanted the children. This is you guys are too young for this, but you but there was a period of time when that was the way it was. That you know, a, a strong teacher was somebody who directed every movement, and the children looked to that teacher for every you know what should I do next. And then you produce children that can't wait for <laughs> Right, and that's not what we want. Um, anyway, so. And then classroom organization, that's you know, behavior management, how we get ex you know, Children knowing the routine, knowing what's expected, um, and, and a lot of proactive things. Productivity, it's like a well oiled machine. It's, you know, your centers work well, your environment works well, your conditions. And then the next dimension is um, instructional learning um, facilitation. And that's where you have, when you, you know, you have a variety of materials, you get a lot of modalities. That should, you, you do say what your objective is, and, and you know what your objective is. one thing about yeah. the clarity of learning objectives, that's something that I see, um, it's, it takes work, it takes a little bit of practice to get that, to tell the children what's happening, what, why are we doing this, and what is to be expected, and that will cut down on behavior issues. So that's one thing that does take a little more practice for many teachers. Okay, so this instructional support, and my, um, <laughs> my plug-in. Um, so this is your curriculum, and I think just a reminder. I think um, going back to that, you know, factory, the robot-like children. Um, I don't know if you all have ever seen this, but school readiness. Um, if a child can hold a pencil, write their own name, count to 100, recognize all their colors and shapes, but does not know how to make friends, manage their emotions, and conflict resolution to be independent and have self-help skills. None of the other stuff matters. So I know, you know, the school readiness, you know, kindergarten, like it's one of those pressures that we all have, but it really to step back and think the social emotional skills is what our job is as preschool teachers. Several years ago, we got a lot of our preschool teachers together with our kindergarten teachers, and it was really interesting because the preschool teachers thought, you know, what the, the kindergarten teachers really wanted was the children to write their name, um, know all the letters, be able to see the words, be able to sound, be able to count everything. And the kindergarten teachers were saying, no, that's not what we want. We can teach that. We want them to understand, um, to be able to cooperate with each other, to be able to work on something without getting frustrated, to be um, generous, to understand how to move from one activity to another. They didn't want any of that other stuff that the preschool teachers felt so pressured to teach. And the preschool teachers are doing a wonderful job of teaching everything else. So, can you share the last time? I have not yet, yet. Yes, yes, I was going to. So, two things I wanted to share. One is, I mean, our job is already hard. You have multiple personalities and they change every year, you know. So, to adjust, you know, it's, that's already tough. But then you have the people who take care of them that they go home to. And they're the ones who you really probably need to educate on what is expected of your three-year-old, of your two-year-old. It is not numbers, it's not letters, it's not reading, it's not all of this. So it really, you know, your job is 10 times tougher because it's that other level of education, you know, to adults, which, you know, again, there's 
sense of resources and you know um, we're going to give you our um, contact information if you ever get into a bind just reach out to us we have great articles great resources for parents to learn about child's development that we can share um, but the uh, points that uh, Kristen brought up is um, Terry and I have both been involved in um, the, the workforce so the teacher um, the early childhood workforce and uh, kind of taking them you know to the next level and who has gotten involved are your corporations big you know, Lockheed Martins yes. and you know all the, the big defense contractors all these people have gotten involved in it because what they are seeing is people who are coming in who cannot work with others and what is our job you know we've gone through these dimensions there's nothing that says they need to be able to read they need to be able to write a four-page report, none of that stuff. It's how do you work with others? So it's very interesting is they're saying, we can teach them the job, but we need them to come in and be willing to learn. It's a soft skills. Yep, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, and it starts. And know how to learn. And know how to learn. Yeah, know how. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when we step back and really just look at what our job is, in a way, it's kind of easier, you know, when you, like you get to play all day, you know? How much more fun is that, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, so for us to get bogged down by the other stuff, especially, you know, I think now we're seeing it in, you know, the toddler classrooms, unfortunately. But, you know, not to get bogged down by that, but to really keep it in perspective of who these children are and what it is that, you know, society is eventually going to be looking for in these people. So, that's my plug-in. This is the instruction. This is the When you get good feedback, you actually increase the persistence that child wants to do it even more. Just like when you're reading the, um, the Hungry Caterpillar, and they said do it again, then you're doing it again, and you're probably adding more dimensions each time you read it. That's, that's really good feedback. Um, and then the last one is the language model. And probably the biggest one is the first one. You can keep the conversation going in your classroom, all of these other things will sort of lead into open the question of the situations. So just so start with keeping the conversation going. And with infants, you know, if you pick up a book and read to them, that's a conversation. So just keep the conversation going. Anyway. So that's the class in a nutshell. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is why we mentioned you do not need to know the nitty gritty. You are already doing a lot of this. You know, we just want you to be aware of what it is you're doing and have that intention behind your practice. So now that you know, how do you make it happen?